Wait, we could have watched the movie. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Trainers Forum presented by HRD Specialized Canine Training. Tonight, we are joined by Lisa Higgins from Louisiana Search and Rescue Dogs. She's from Pearl River, Louisiana. Just a, a few housekeeping meetings uh things uh about our meetings uh try not to log on to the course more than 10 minutes before scheduled session um each month simply so we don't eat up a bunch of bandwidth recording a lot of dead air time make sure your video is off and your audio is muted if you've got questions if you're on the zoom platform you'll be able to go into the chat feature and send us a message or if you're on the Facebook live platform you will be able to send us a message there and we will try our best to make sure that we clarify or get those questions answered you can also send messages privately or to the entire group uh, you might also in preparation for our next session, submit questions to HRD Trainers Forum at gmail.com. So, this is Lisa Higgins with her little dog Penny. Um, Lisa, as many of y'all know and have worked with in the past. Lisa has been behind a dog since 1989 uh, when she helped co-found Lassar Dogs there in Louisiana. In that point in time, from that point in time, I know she has worked a Golden Retriever, another little Black Lab, an Australian Shepherd, um, and also a Dutch Shepherd, Dixie. Lisa has taught probably hundreds of courses simply because she's never at home. She's getting better <laughs> though, um, but she has relentlessly uh, traversed this country uh, back and forth since the mid 90s teaching classes um, principally in water recovery but also in other disciplines such as area search but um, tonight Lisa has joined us to talk to us a little bit about how she goes about selecting a pup or a young dog as a search candidate. And by all means, if I have missed anything in your introduction, Lisa, I apologize. Feel free to correct me, as I know you will. And I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm impressed. You remembered a lot. Actually, Dixie is a Malinois German Shepherd cross. Um, and of course, now I'm working Penny as he showed you. So you did good. Um, I actually started working with dogs as far back as 1978, but I only started doing scent detection since 89. So you were very close. Okay, so we're going to talk about first puppies. I love the puppy parts. Um, a lot of people prefer to get a dog they can start working right away. Well, I do start working my puppy right away. Uh, my background is law enforcement. That's where I started and then went into um, SAR at the same time, but a little bit behind uh, the police work. So what I like about a puppy is you're bringing home a clean slate. It has no nasty background. Nobody chased it with a broom. Nobody threw it out and left it in the yard without um, interacting with it. 
you got a clean slate to work with, and I really like that. I'm going to look typically what breed do I want, and then I'm going to look for a breeder that really knows their line. Because, um, you know, lots of people are breeding puppies. That doesn't mean they know all of that. So I go to people that are really confident. And you can usually tell because they're going to listen to what you're looking for. And they're going to watch their puppies as they grow. And they're going to kind of look and see who's showing those uh, kind of traits that I want. But it's not so only up to them. I have to go in and look at the pups myself. So I usually go in at five weeks and then again at seven weeks before I make a final decision most of the time. Rarely does anything change from the five-week to seven-week period. But every once in a while, it does. Every one of my puppies that I picked out this way for myself, as well as other people, have all made working dogs. And let me tell you that I'm knocking on wood so I don't jinx myself saying that. I just maybe have been very lucky. But it has worked out, including Paul's Ziva. So um, we got a good track record going. All right, one of the main things I'm going to look for in a puppy is balance. I don't want a puppy overly dominant, and I don't want a puppy overly shy. Both become a problem. An over-the-top dominant dog is going to be stubborn, is going to be headstrong. Now, sometimes that's good because they'll take just about anything you throw at them, but training is a bit tougher. I like a dog that thinks instead of just reacts. I love to work with retrieve drives. I'm not against food. I've had a dog that was food drive. I prefer the retrieve drive. It's just easier to teach. What I'm going to do when I go in to look at the puppies is take them away from their mom, but I'm going to leave them where they're comfortable at first. And I'm going to reach down and pick up and all the puppies at some point behind the front legs under the belly and chest and I'm going to lift them only a few inches off the ground. I want to see a puppy that struggles a little bit and then stops and thinks. Struggles a little bit and then stops and thinks. If they just struggle and struggle and struggle, they're usually going to be pretty dominant. If they just hang in your hand, they're going to oftentimes be too soft. I want balance. The next thing I might try is a sudden loud noise, pans, pots, um, a loud sudden whistle right over that litter of puppies. They should all startle a little bit, but who comes back to investigate it? It's usually that little puppy that was a, a thinker. The dominant ones will come back, but not always as quick. I want curiosity in my pup. I want them to come and check out, what did that? Then I'm going to roll a toy through them. I want to see if somebody wants to possess that toy over all the other puppies. Then I may try a scented toy. And since a lot of us do HR, that's obviously going to be the odor I use. Is anybody um, afraid of it? Or are they going to try to hang on to it and keep it away from the others? You're going to find most of the time the balanced pup is the one who is going to take everything over. Then I'm going to take them one at a time away from their comfort zone with the breeder. Which puppy is going to want to chase the crazy lady that has never met before? The puppy that's going to leave everything comfortable and go check it out. Obviously, I need a pup willing to go. I don't want one that's going to hang back and whine. So those are the basic tests I do with little bitty puppies. The oldest puppy I've tested and worked out is my current pup, Penny Lane. Um, she was 10 weeks old, and I was allowed to look at several litters, some a little older, some younger. And I could see in this 10-week-old puppy a huge desire to work, totally curious, unafraid of anything she stepped on or went through. The clincher was when she went into a bush with a scent that was down for 30 days that they'd forgotten and pulled it out for us. That told me that was a puppy that was going to work. Now, I have taken on older dogs. 
Um, anybody that's met Kathy Holbert out of West Virginia has some lovely dogs. And that's where I got uh, Dixie from. When I went to look at Dixie, she was about nine months old. She and her brother were available. And when I played with the pups, I could see who had the better hunt drive. And that was Dixie, who had the better retreat drive. And yet again, it turned out to be Dixie. She was a little bit more dominant than her brother, but he sure grew into his role later and became a narcotics dog. So both were really good quality dogs. I personally don't look at the sex when I'm checking out puppies. Whatever the landing gear is, when I find all the other traits I want, that's the puppy I'm bringing home, male or female. I have had both. Sometimes you find the males can be a little bit harder, a little bit stubborn. They're not stupid. I'm not knocking males at all. They just sometimes are a little harder. Females tend to work with you a little easier, but they can sometimes be softer. So that's, again, and you're going to hear me say it several times, that's why, again, I go to balance. Because male or female, I need the dog that's a thinker. I need the dog that's not going to roll over and, and give up because I had to correct her for something that she should not have done. And so far, both my male and females have done that. So I've been pretty satisfied with them. Um, when it comes to different litters or different breeds, normally, if you're a first-time handler, I'm going to suggest a retriever. They're so much easier to learn from and to work with. But the caveat to that, if you've raised German Shepherds all your life, pick a German Shepherd. Um, so I'm not breed specific. I work many breeds, but my test for the litters are always the same. The only time the test is a bit hard is if your breeder has done a ton of hands-on, letting other people hold the puppies and play with them. Sometimes they just become, oh, you're picking me up, and they just, ha they just hang there. So that part can kind of fool you, and you have to look for other things, like the toy rolling through the group. I want possessiveness because possessiveness of a toy or an object is going to bring possessiveness of odor. So basically, that's what I look for. What do you think, Paul? You got a question? Yeah, we have a, a couple of questions that have been submitted. So. Okay, someone that's just asked you look, want possessive. I mean, across the screen. I do. Possessiveness of a toy often brings possessiveness of odor. Go ahead, Paul, if you want to start with your question. Somebody else type that out. Yeah, that was Joy. So these are the submitted questions. We'll go through those real quick first. So once a dog has shown suitability for SAR work, are there indicators that would be better for one discipline over another, HRD versus live find during that selection process? Well, the selection process that I use is going to show me both. If that puppy came after the crazy lady, she's going to be willing to go look for strangers. If that puppy also possessed that um, toy that had odor adhering to it, it's not going to be intimidated or worried about finding the um, human remains. So um, I think maybe at that point you're going to look at um, different things. For example, um, you as a handler, um, does your time allow you to jump out and go after a rescue that can be any time of the day or night or do you need to schedule your searches a little bit better sometimes we can do that with hr y'all have to remember it's not just the puppy or the dog that you're working with we have to bring ourselves and our family into it so that brings up another point when you're picking the breed that you'd like to work from don't go after a breed just because it's popular right now 
most especially if it doesn't work in your household. If you don't have the time to help a high-drive dog become comfortable with small children, you may not want the Malinois or the bigger shepherds that their tail is going to knock your baby down. you got to look at all those things. So I actually haven't seen in this selection process one thing over the other. Okay. So our next question, when getting your pup, what is an ideal age to bring it home? Will it harm the relationship if you bring it home after 12 weeks old? I do not believe it's going to harm the pup to take it home at 12 weeks old. I think if you bring it home too young, like five weeks before it's had a chance to learn all that it needs to learn in the litter and with its mother, that's more damaging, I think, than waiting a little longer. There's things they learn within that litter. And then, again, dependent on your breeder, they may feel that they cannot let a puppy go home before Ten weeks. Um, so you're going to have to work with your um, breeder. The dog I brought home at exactly seven weeks was the most focused dog I've ever had. Go home before eight or ten weeks. So you're going to have to hold on a moment, Lisa. The dog I brought home at exactly seven weeks was the Focus dogs I've never had. Before. Okay, Lisa. Okay. I've got that. Now, and remember, I picked out 10, minutes, 10 weeks, but I didn't bring her home until she was a year old. Um, I got her from a breeder that loves to start her dogs, and um, she offered to do that. I'd not ever had one like that before. I did wait, and I was a little nervous. I tell you what, she's as close to me as any dog I've ever had, and having started already, my work was a little lighter, so it was kind of nice. Okay. Um, we just had a, a question pop up um, from one of our participants. To your knowledge, is there a way of testing if a pup will be better with hot trails or cold trails? I think that's actually more in your training. Now, having said that, everybody knows that um, a hound is supposed to be better at a cold trail. I will tell you I know of a golden retriever that successfully worked out his own day on that and showed up good to me at the end of it. So, you want the dog, obviously, that's a working breed. You want the dog with the longer nose. You want the dog that has endurance. And then you have to build the training in. I've not been able to see at this point, nor have I actually truly tested for um, that kind of thing as a young puppy. Okay. So here's a, a great big long question. My dog Titus and I have been doing nose work and he is currently trained on Birch and Anise. We love this activity, but I've always hoped to be able to one day do HRD work with Titus. I've been told in a Facebook scent work group that we absolutely should not, in some cases legally, cannot do HRD work since he has been trained in a scent sport. I was told that if I wanted a working dog, I should have trained him as a work, working dog. Being new to these types of training activities, I never knew any of this as I initially got into nose work with Titus as a fun activity to do with him where he could problem solve and get some energy out. And you're experience do you think this to be true his indication for nose work started as a focus there and we have been working on a set indication if we had a different indication for hrd say a down would it still be possible 
to train and potentially deploy a on a volunteer basis if he could obtain his HRD certification. Wow. Well, do I think the dog can do it? Yes. But unfortunately, there's things you have to consider. Um, law enforcement today feels that a single purpose dog is the stronger dog. If you really want to get into HRD work, you, you're probably going to have to stop the nose work. That's hard for me to say because on the one hand, your dog is learning search technique. But if you find yourself in court on an HRD case and you, they ask you if, if that's all your dog does and now you bring out the fact that you do nose work, does it throw doubt in the jury's mind when the defense attorney says, oh, your dog finds other odors. How do I know he didn't switch over? So I don't think it's as simple as can the dog make the shift. I think they can. And I think if whoever this is wants to do that, you may have to give up nose work. Now, I've not done nose work, but I, have, I used to allow my dog to find um, pets that were injured like in a car wreck or something and would run off and I found out later that was going to hurt me and I had to stop doing that and only work human odor. I think this may fall into the same category but I've never looked that up so keep checking on it. Off the top of my head I'm thinking it may create a problem if you keep doing it. Good deal. Okay. So on to, okay. Is the key to separate the train final response and stopping the sport work? I think that's uh, exactly what Lisa was saying. So question four, question four has multiple parts. And some of this you've already answered, but we'll go through it anyway. Do you evaluate different breeds differently, labs versus shepherds, as an example? Nope. nope, I do every breed the same, labs, Australian shepherds, it doesn't matter. German shepherds, it doesn't matter. I test the puppies all the same way. What are the typical ages for evaluation, how early, and how does this change? Okay, so I mentioned that when I look at a litter, I like, I like to go and look at them at five weeks and seven weeks. Um, that's worked for me, but y'all, many ways to get this job done. That has just worked for me, and that's why I recommend it. Um, it's going to change as the puppy gets older. The 10-week-old puppy that I picked out, the lab I have now. She was much more mature at 10 weeks than I expected. And the nose work she was already showing at 10 weeks was unbelievable to me. Um, that's probably not what you're going to see in the five to seven week. So um, as the puppy ages, you're going to have to pull out different ways to evaluate them. Um, throwing a toy still is okay, but picking them up under the back legs may not work under the front legs. I mean, may not work anymore. Um, depends on the size of the pup and all of that. So um, I'm going to start looking at, as they get older, I'm going to start looking at um, endurance. I'm going to start looking at structure. I'm going to start looking at um, its drives. Does it want to hunt? Um, does it become, um, does it need you to be close by? Is it willing to range out from me? Um, that kind of thing. I'm going to start looking at more of that as they get older. Okay. What do you look for in a breeder? What type of puppy socialization, et cetera, are you expecting? Well, if they're the little bitty puppies, if I'm bringing one home as a, a, a real youngster, most of what they're going to be exposed to has been with the mother and the litter. I mean, I can't imagine with a young 
um, immune system like that, that they're going to get them out too, too much. That's okay. That's part of my job. Um, and I mentioned earlier that when I look for a breeder, it's somebody that's been at this a while, and they're careful about what they're doing, and they know their breed. For example, Australian Shepherds. You can't breed Merle to Merle. You could get lethal white. If you breed three generations that were born without a tail, you could get uh, spinal problems. A breeder has to know those things so they don't have those problems. I want a breeder that, that is that educated. In the case of people uh, I mentioned earlier, Kathy Hobart, um, people like her, she breeds, she raises puppies, but she's worked dogs for so long, she knows what she's looking for. She knows her lines and how she's going to best cross them. That's the kind of breeder I want to go to. Um, where I got my uh, lab uh, up in Maine. It's a uh, a large um, breeder. Uh, they breed a lot of labs up there um, for all different types, and they know their lines and um, produce some really nice pups. So it was real easy to go there. Okay. How do you evaluate young dogs, say eight months old to a year, and what are some of the basic skills or attributes do you wish to see? Um, and the, the questioner wrote, I assume copper pipe addiction is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new one on me. <laughs> Okay, and then what do I do with rescue dogs, shelter-based? Um, you know, yeah. um, why would someone be rehoming an eight-month-old dog? Um, I would think if you had one from puppy to eight months, I would hope that it was raised really well, has been around other people, has been around sm children, um, has been in cars, you know, if it's going to be car sick or if it's going to be a problem. Um the nice thing about an eight-month-old, while that's not when you're going to truly check for hips and all that kind of stuff, you're going to have a pretty good idea of structure and if they're sound. Um, you're going to also have a pretty good idea if they're going to be afraid of slick fours, um, if they're going to be nervous about loud noises and that kind of thing. So you may see more of that at the eight-month-old to a year. Um, I'm going to look at the drives. Does it want to come out and hunt? Does it like to play ball with you? Does it like to interact with you? Because that's its payday. It may be food. It may be tug. It may be throwing a toy. Does he enjoy it? You have to have a way to reward, and comfortably so, one that makes the dog want to work for you. Um, let's see. So those are kind of things I, I would be looking for. Um, I still, I don't know what you mean when you say copper pipe addiction. I still want possessiveness of a toy, but I mean, come on. Now there's got to be some control. I just want them to want that favorite toy so much that they'll work for it. So if you call that an addiction, then I'll, I kind of want one, but not over the top. Um, when it comes to rescue dogs, I know people that have taken rescue dogs and have done some very nice work. But I've also seen some rescue dogs, fabulous workers, but because of the time they were on the street, stopped working and eat the fried chicken bones that one of the deputies threw under a vehicle. You want a dog to remain focused, right? He can't, he can't just turn off what you've asked him to do to go run and get the chicken bones. So there are things you may have to fight or overcome with a rescue dog. And you're not going to know what those are until you live and start a train with them. So while it can be done, and I have certainly gone and looked at shelter dogs and placed them, you do have to think about that. I also worry as a shelter dog, if it lived on the street, was it nutritionally met as it was growing up? Or am I going to end up having some kind of physical problem show up later because they were not nutritionally met. Um, I, I guess that's just some of the things I think about. I have rescue dogs before, but not my working dogs. My working dogs have all come from a breeder. 
Okay. We had a submitted question from one of our participants. Would you ever trust a breeder to pick a pup from a litter for SAR work if it is not possible to travel to the breeder to test pups using your criteria and the breeder has worked with SAR handlers and has pioneered lines that have yielded dogs successful in SAR? I would consider that. Um, my first lab, I did not get to pick out of the litter. She was handed to me from another officer with the sheriff's office. It was out of uh, two working narcotics dogs. And he gave me the pup because she was most like her mother, which was a dynamic narcotics dog. We never looked back. From the moment I brought her home, she was a fabulous working dog. So, yes, I do think sometimes, and remember, it wasn't just because she was like her mom. He worked dogs. He knew what he was looking for. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, uh, another lady on my team has a warmer on her, and she was unable to travel up and make a decision. She has a fabulous working dog, and the breeder picked it out. So, yes, if they are in the know, if they've worked extensively with other handlers that work dogs, I'd consider it. And I'll, I'll just interject, you know, that Abby, I wasn't able to go evaluate that litter, and she's turning out to be a nice little dog. But again, the, the breeder had worked dogs before. She has produced other dogs that are in the field working, um, and, and she used the, the criteria uh, to evaluate, and so I think that is a good, great possibility. Um, so, moving forward. So, the the one that was just submitted <laughs> by our viewer and had previously been submitted, kind of join, but. I will be choosing a golden retriever from a litter that is being bred this week. Are there certain things I should be looking for in terms of preferable traits for this breed? The breeder has given me pick of the litter and supports my aptitude testing require request. I just don't know what the aptitude test should consist of for puppies. Some of the more popular SAR ones seem oriented for older do dogs, like the Brownell Marcellus scale, for example. The mating dogs are from working lines. Thanks in advance. Kudos to you for going to working lines. I love the Golden Retriever. But the ones bred for show are big boned, heavy coated, and you have to consider where are you going to be working? If you're going to work in the South, that's hard on them. Our heat and humidity is going to take its toll. The smaller, uh, lighter working lines are going to hold up better. They're going to have um, better endurance, and they're going to probably have better drive. So good for you for looking at a working line. Um, just look for that balance we talked about. Um, that's what I look for in mine. And um, he was a good worker. No big problems at all. You get to get pick of the litter, good for you. You're gonna end up picking up the pup. That means that works the best for you. When you look at them and you do those tests, you're gonna know which one's right. Now, don't get hung up on color because you're not working color, you're working the dog. So look for all those traits we talked about earlier, especially if you get to go check them out as they're young, but listen to your breeder. If she's breeding working lines, she knows something about them. She may make recommendations and it may fall right in line with what you're seeing as you test the litter. Don't rule, don't rule your breeder out. Okay, so the, the one that came from our audience is looking at a field line golden retriever. 
breeder knows what makes good hunting dogs, are these similar to traits needed for HRD? Just don't let them start them on birds or something before you get them. <laughs> I don't know if that would be a good idea. Um, although it would give you some idea if they want to hunt. So um, I, I, it's probably going to be just fine. You're going to teach them from early on that humans is what they're hunting. It's going to be okay. Okay. So that is the last of our submitted questions. Does anybody else have a question they would like to ask Lisa? while well, we've got a, a few more minutes before our hour is up. Lisa, in the meantime, where are some places that people could come take one of your classes this year? Well, uh, had I known you would have asked me that, I'd have had my calendar in front of me. Um, I'm going to be in Bay County, Florida in February. I'm going to be in Maryland in March, um, as well as um, the end of March will be in Holly Springs, Mississippi for NNCDS. Um, yep, I need my calendar. <laughs> I'm booked all the way through <laughs> October. I don't remember them all off of my head. If you can give me a minute, I can run and get it. <laughs> Okay, well, Actually, uh, I can take, I can we take can you with do me. <laughs> also, uh, <laughs> while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and ask uh, a question that just came in. Okay. If you know you are looking for an HRK, HR canine, do you check them for an aversion or attraction to odor? Oh, sure. If you know, those puppies that don't want to go in a scented toy, that aversion. The ones that, you know, aren't crazy about it and just kind of hold back. Yeah, I'm, that's kind of a problem. An older dog, if they jump back from it or they're uncertain, play with them a little bit and see if that changes. Because sometimes just being new is enough to kind of make them think. But. Anything that shows me it's not liking it, I'm kind of worried. Okay. Um, Is that what you're asking? Did I miss anything? Robin. No. Uh, Robin uh, just reminded you that you're going to be in Iowa this year. Yeah, I was getting there. I was getting there. April is is Arkansas with uh, NASDAQ. That's the week of the 22nd through the 26th. Um, I'll be at the uh, fax facility in Texas, May 14th through the 17th. And then Iowa in June, the 10th through the 14th. Well, I guess we start on the 11th. I get there on the 10th. Um, and then we're going to have a little break, and then an advanced class is going to come up right behind it. And August, yay, is open. I'm going to do a water seminar up in Virginia with uh, the FBI. So if you had a chance to work with them, come on out. There's going to be CSAR in September, the 21st through the 25th, um, October is Ohio the four, uh, around the 14th through the 18th and I think that's it. Yep, that's it. And sometime we're, we're and I know sometime we're looking at going out to Montana but we haven't hammered those dates out. So while we were doing that we've gotten a couple more questions in. Okay. You know, oh, no. We've already covered that one. I have a puppy who had a very strong, who had a very strong toy drive when she was young. She's now 10 months old 
and loves toys in the house, but ignores them outside. Is there a technique you use to build toy drop as a reward for correctly indicating in unfamiliar environments? Well, now, isn't that interesting? Loves it inside, but not outside. So that makes me wonder if you have found the right toy for the dog. Some of them like the little squeakers, some of them don't. The glow in the dark balls just turn them on unbelievably. So I don't know if you've tried that. I think what I would start with first is a small area and just play and make it fun. But make sure you're fun too. Okay, don't just toss it. Have a good time. Play with the dog. If we start getting it in a small outside area, then we can go to larger areas. Play it before you put it with odor, though. Don't just expect it to work with odor if it's not happy with it otherwise. While I am a big proponent of toy drive, and I, I truly enjoy it, maybe your dog would prefer tug. Maybe it wants to interact with you closer. Try that. Um, but don't be afraid of a food drive dog. They work just as well. This is a little bit more for you to do. Okay. And when you start that small area, make sure that small area is one the dog is comfortable in, like a, your backyard or, or your front yard or something. A place the dog is comfortable. Then take it someplace else and play. Small area, bounce it, make it fun, make it look alive. Have a good time. But don't let it stop you if it doesn't work. Coming from, you got to thank you very much. Brilliant oh, response. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming from one of our Facebook Live viewers, what do you consider aversion behaviors? Um, you know, if they totally ignore it, obviously that's one. If they go to it and back off suddenly, that's one. And that's usually what you're going to see, mo that I see most of. Um, we get a little nervous about the idea of sensing a toy and then letting the dog retrieve. But when you're teaching, when you're trying to figure out if the dog likes the odor, don't be afraid to put it on a tennis ball or something like that. Well, let me put it this way. Let's use the Kong tennis balls, not the real tennis balls that have been shown to create illness in dogs. But the Kong ones do not. And they'll adhere odor if you put them in a box with your uh, training aids and throw it for the dog. See what he thinks of it. See if he likes it. If he doesn't want to play with it, you can still work with it a little bit and see if you can make them comfortable. But true aversion, they don't want anything to do with it. They hackle up, they tuck, they squat, or they back off. None of that is good. Okay. Any other Oh, another one just popped up. Am I wrong by removing all the inside toys and just have them at work, giving only chew type stuff inside to avoid boredom? Actually, that may be the ticket. My dogs do not have toys unless we are interacting together. It may be that I don't have time to take them on a good hike. So I'm going to let them retrieve for a little bit and burn off a little energy and be happy and freshen their minds from being in kennels or being in the yard all day. But I'm interacting with them. They don't get them free choice. So whoever it was that asked about a dog that liked the toys inside but not outside, thank you. Pick them up and let's see if that'll make a difference. Give them a healthy something to chew, but they should only chew when you're watching them. You don't want a choke issue. Um, and then try playing with your toys outside and see if that makes a difference. Very good suggestion. Um, how do you suggest a person handle introducing a new HRD pup to an older dog that has been doing HRD? Basically, the older dog has gotten all the attention, and that is now shifting. Can you bring that back to me one more time? Somebody typed something, and it, it caught my eye. 
can bring that back one more time. Okay. How do you suggest a person handle introducing a new HRD pup to an older dog that has been doing HRD? Basically, the older dog has gotten all of the attention. Wow. I'm going to tell you that I, I don't really have a problem with that. So I typically have a dog working until it's about eight years old, and then I'm going to start my second dog. The theory being that the older dog is still young enough to keep going while I have time to train the pup. If you bring them home as a puppy, oftentimes it's not a big issue. Um, and I will tell you that in the beginning, I'll work the older dog first every time to make them, and this may just be purely human thinking, but to make them still feel that they're number one. But I am always bringing up that puppy's confidence. And as they come together and grow together, then it's no big deal when you swap out and let the other work first and then bring the older dog in. If you're bringing in a little bit older dog, not a puppy, I usually bring them to um, an area that's, <coughs> excuse me, negative to both of them. It's not home where the older dog believes that's his den and this is the stranger coming in. I'll take them for walks uh, and if you need to, have a friend come with you. You walk the older dog, they walk the younger dog next to them with a little bit of distance. And as they become comfortable and you let them run around together, proximity is a great teacher. Put them in kennels side by side and they get to know each other that way. Um, I've not had a problem with that and I do it all the time. And that's typically how I do it. Okay, one of our Facebook live viewers sent in after the first scent introduction during your aptitude test when is the next time the puppy or dog gets exposure to scent what is your procedure for the very first stage of scent familiarization oh bummer <laughs> I'm going to create some controversy, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. The first thing I'm going to do is after I test the puppies and decide which one I'm bringing home, when I bring it home, I give it a week without doing any kind of scent work. I let them get comfortable with what their new home is. I get them out. I let them play. I teach them to come back to me in happy, fun games with the older dog because um, they're great teachers doing it that way. And then... After that week is over and he knows who his new um, owner is and he knows where all the good things, the food and everything comes from, now we're ready to go play. All right, so there are some people that are excellent at back chaining their dogs and starting with odor and indication from very, very young. <coughs> um, Lillian Hardy up in Indiana does a really nice job at that. She works now and was. Um, I worked one time with uh, Chris Mayhew out of Montana. She was introducing me to some of that, and it works really well. I'm not the person to talk to about that because it's not the way I like to do it. I take an eight-week-old or 10-week-old puppy most of the time and actually start them with live work. Now, the reason I do that is because of what they learn in the process. And I'm not going to do it for a very long time. I'm going to teach this little bitty puppy um, a start, a command, and go straight to my person. And they're learning to discriminate scent all along. They don't know that's what they're learning, but they are. And I do begin to get to scent specific. When the pup's a little older, if I know I'm going to do HRD, and I've obviously already ran the scent past them and know that they're not adverse to it. I'm not going to revisit the live find ever again. But I like the confidence it teaches. I like that it has um, um, positive reinforcement from both ends of the lead, the person holding the pup, the person running from the pup. There's a lot of positive that goes on. And they learn what scent does um, across different terrains, 
um, now through a ditch, up a tree, you name it, they start learning it very, very young in a very fun way. They're also learning recalls. They're learning socialization while you're doing this. A lot comes out of it. Then when I start them on their human remains detection, I personally like to start with U.S. Customs method for sense association, mostly because it's a proven uh, technique in court, so I don't have to worry about any doubt that my dog was properly taught the odor. You can start that at about five to six months old. And that is a nice way to start the older okay. dog. That you <laughs> Could you discuss your preferred indication to teach the pup for HRD? I like to look at what the dog chooses, if at all possible. My Australian Shepherd being a herding dog, what does the herding dog do? Watch the sheep down and wait, move over, down and watch. So she actually picked the down right off. I just encouraged it at odor and kept it strong, and I never had a problem with it because she chose it. If I go to something else because somebody says, oh, your dog needs to do this, but it's not what my dog wants to do, I'm going to be constantly fighting that. So let's go back to that Aussie that liked to down. And let's say that I want to bark. Well, number one, the dog didn't hardly ever bark anyway. Oh, yeah, if a stranger came by, but that's normal dog behavior, knock on the door. But when she was out, you rarely heard anything out of her. If I could have gotten that bark, I could have pushed her for it. She would have reverted to the down because that's what she preferred. It would have become her default behavior. Why not strengthen what the dog's natural instinct is to do. Having said that, remember that digging is very natural and in most places it's not allowed anymore. So, okay, that's one natural instinct I'm not going to encourage, even though I love it. Okay. What literature do you recommend for those of us that live outside the United States and cannot attend your seminars? Well, there's always Andy Redman's book. It's still pretty good. I was looking at it today. Um, that's probably the one I'd go to, quite honestly. It gives you a lot of information about um, considering puppies, um, considering the sex of the puppy. It also talks about the, some of the technical or scientific stuff about the olfactory and the brain and how they come together and how it works. And, and then they talk about how scent travels and moves and how the dog may react to it. So I'd probably go to that book right off if it's, if it's an HRD dog. And because I haven't been reading a lot lately, I'd have to look that one up for you. That might be a better question for you, Paul. <laughs> Okay, so the name of the the book is the Cadaver Dog Handbook. Yep. By Andy Redman. So we're going to go ahead and begin drawing this to a close. Next month's guest is Robin Grubel. Uh, from Canine Census. Oh. No, no, Sarah, she put a free picture on. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> okay. We, we've got one last question from June at Maranatha when told about all of the attributes I desire in my pup next SAR dog and asked about the process she uses for selecting dogs for handlers who do who desire working dogs we select from we simply select from proven breedings and look for confident outgoing puppies with brave hearts much of what you wrote about is what you do or won't it's true all of our pups dogs go to busy people 
the desire to have pups that have high drive. They then pick up their pups, take them home, and train. Sorry, I can be more technical, but we keep it really simple. It's all in the breeding, selection, and training after. Have fun and say hi to Lisa for me. Her penny lane is from here. We selected her for Lisa and then gave her a jump start. Yep, you didn't give me the ground rules, and I didn't know if I was supposed to be able to say a breeder. So that is where Penny came from, and I have been exceptionally happy with her. Uh, we did a search today that was ungodly, and thank God that dog ranges like she does, because I could never have covered that by myself. <laughs> and so. as soon as somebody, she is a breeder. If I went for a lab, she is a breeder. If she recommended one, if you told her what you wanted and she recommended one, I would most assuredly listen to what she had to say. So if you have any additional questions, please shoot them to either me at P.S. Martin at HRD Specialized Canine dot com and I will forward that on to Lisa. Or I can uh, also take those uh, messages from Facebook and, and so forth and get those over. And we might do a follow-up session during the year sometime, just depending on what schedules al allow, because this is a brand new thing for us here with HRD Specialized Canine Training. So check us out for our future classes. Check out Lisa's schedule. She's going to be pretty much all over the country this year again. And I want to wish all of y'all a great night and a great weekend of training. Good luck and stay safe on searches. Bye, y'all.